gold has traditionally been both a store of value and a medium of exchange. That's important to understand. Guess what, folks? We're buying more gold. For me, gold is a store of wealth, a medium of exchange, liquidity, and insurance. I was curious to get your thoughts on why you've changed your forecasts and feelings on silver. This is probably an especially good time to grow a small business. So many private businesses are owned and controlled by baby boomers who are retiring. The idea that these other banks don't think that gold is good security is absolutely mind numbing to me. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone. Welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show here on ITM Trading. Joined today by Rick Rule, founder, president, CEO of Rule Investment Media. Rick, always a pleasure being with you. So good to see you, friend. Daniela, the pleasure is mine. I'm delighted to be with you on your new platform. Yes. Well, so much uh, to catch up with you uh, today. Uh, surprise, surprise. We're going to talk gold. Let's start there. Um, all time highs, Rick. The last time we spoke, uh, gold wasn't as exciting as as what we're seeing these days. I know we're down a little bit today, but overall, uh, just a great season for gold. And we get it. Central banks are driving demand. We get it. It's a China story. But I want to take a deep dive uh, with you today, if that's OK. Delighted. I'll, I'll do my best. As you know, I think about gold fairly frequently. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we think about it a little too much. Uh, but like I said, we get it. People in China are so spooked about the economy that even the weak currency isn't stopping them from buying uh, more gold. I guess my, my, my first question to you is, how come people in China get it, but here in North America, we're not really waking up fully to the idea of gold yet? I would suggest to you, Daniela, that even Chinese, the Chinese citizenry doesn't get it, although they're getting it better. The statistics would seem to indicate that the recent strength in gold, and by recent, I mean the last two years, has been more a function of central bank buying than retail buying, even in China. The Chinese market, and to a lesser extent, the Indian market, uh, has seen more retail buying than the U.S. market, which has in fact seen retail selling. But the statistics would suggest that the buyers of gold in real size have been foreign central banks reacting, uh, I suspect, by the U.S. government's attempt to weaponize the U.S. dollar, whether it is seizing $300 billion worth of Russian holdings of U.S. Treasury securities, which should make any country that holds its wealth in U.S. Treasury is concerned, uh, or the weaponization of the of, of the SWIFT banking system by the U.S. Uh, to reinforce sanctions. Whether or not, as an American, you agree with those policies or not, they're disquieting uh, to foreign central banks who have suddenly come to understand that denominating all of their foreign currency transactions and their national savings in U.S. dollars and U.S. Treasury securities is not a good thing. Um, with regards to the difference between Chinese buying, that is Chinese retail buying, uh, and U.S. retail buying, the Chinese government has an official policy of encouraging their savers to save, uh, among other things, in gold. Uh, which is to say that they have facilitated gold transactions and encouraged it after uh, you know, a policy many years ago of making it illegal. So there's probably an awful lot of pent up demand in China, which is also facilitated by the Chinese government. And as you say, the weakness uh, in the renminbi has meant that uh, while gold has done well in US dollars, it's done very, very, very well in renminbi. Well, you, you beat me to my next question. I was going to say, you know, they're they're also very vocal. The Chinese central bank is very vocal about the gold they're buying. You know, as as we know, they don't necessarily have to report. They choose when to report. They were radio silent for years, Rick. And now every month, it seems they're coming out saying, guess what, folks? We're buying more gold. But I think you, you answered that question saying it's a direct response to what the U.S. Uh, has done with 
their currency. Correct. I, I, I think in fairness that we haven't left them many choices. Uh, gold has traditionally been both a store of value and a medium of exchange. That's important to understand. While it doesn't provide a yield like U.S. Treasuries uh, in terms of being a savings instrument for the Chinese central bank, uh, it provides them more security of principle than other currencies of trading partners that they may have, the Russians as an example, or the Chinese. So gold is, I think, for the Chinese central banks and for many other central banks, uh, fulfilling its traditional role, both as a medium of exchange uh, and as a store of value. Imagine if you were the Chinese uh, and you ended up with several trillion rubles uh, and you didn't have the ability to spend on anything from Russia. Uh, in you, when it, it was efficacious for them to denominate their trade in U.S. dollars, they did it, and they did it comfortably for years, and they were for years the largest holders of U.S. treasuries. The relationship between the U.S. government and the Chinese government now probably leaves the Chinese no choice but to reduce their mm -hmm. holdings of U.S. treasuries and substitute gold for that asset class. And as we're speaking, I mean, just over the, the weekend, Russia threatened to step up strikes on Ukraine in response to the U.S. vote to provide new military aid to the government in Kiev. As we know, this past weekend, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a $95 billion package providing support mostly to Ukraine, but also Israel and Taiwan. Uh, so now Russia saying uh, they plan to retaliate. I mean, will Europe suffer uh, the most from it? Uh, that's above my pay grade, Danielle. To be honest with you, I'm tempted to respond but I'm not a foreign policy analyst and I'm not a military analyst. Uh, I am pretty good at looking at statistics around gold <laughs> and the response by central banks around the world when they feel that their own self-interest is threatened by the U.S. government uh, are responding by buying gold. It will be interesting, I think, uh, if retail buying in Western Europe and North America begins to follow through on top of central bank buying. Uh, all of us around the gold community looked at who the former buyer of gold was when gold was strong, uh, which is to say individual savers. This is a really a new phenomenon for us to have the market being led by institutions. Uh, we all thought that gold was the anti-institution instrument. But it's strange to see yeah. the strength in gold led by institution with thus far very little retail follow through. If you layer retail follow through on top of this institutional strength, because both constituencies have an interest in gold, uh, I think you could see a very, very interesting move. I think um, I think you're right on there. And just looking a little deeper at the retail, um, I know you've said we're seeing the selling of gold, uh, people not really stepping in to buy gold because most people I speak to, you know, I get the answer, well, it looks too high at these prices. Um, and I know in the past, Rick, you've said you don't own gold because you think it's going to go to two, 4,000 or whatever, 5,000. Uh, you're afraid it's going to go to, you know, 9,000, 9, 10,000. Yeah, I have two comments there. The first thing is when people say that gold is broken out to new all-time highs, they're talking about nominal highs, not inflation-adjusted highs. Uh, work that I have seen by the World Gold Council suggests that in constant dollars, that gold would have to break out above 2700 to get to new real highs. It's interesting that when people talk about money, they don't talk about money in terms of the constant. Uh, and when you talk about gold, you are talking about the constant. So my suggestion would be uh, for gold to take out the old highs, which I think it will do, uh, it would have to go through 2700. But your bigger point is more important. For me, gold isn't a trading vehicle. Uh, for me, gold is a store of wealth, a medium of exchange, liquidity, <laughs> uh, and insurance. And I own gold because I'm afraid of our incomprehensible debt levels. Uh, I own gold because the interest expense of the U.S. government uh, is, I think, uh, and I point, I, I say the U.S. government, but I could just as well say the EU or Canada, 
uh, is going to overwhelm uh, our ability to sustain it. I'm old enough, Daniela, that I remember the decade of the 70s. We dealt with it by inflating away the purchasing power of the instrument that the debt was denominated in. Over the course of the decade of the 1980s, the purchasing power, constant purchasing power of the U.S. dollar declined by 80 percent. Uh, I think that that sort of thing is precisely what's on offer now. If that's right, uh, and I believe it's right, if that's right, you could be talking about a gold price that was $7,000 or $8,000 or $9,000 or $10,000. Am I saying gold is going to go to $10,000? No, but I'm saying that there is a strong enough possibility of it and the consequences of that for you maintaining your lifestyle with a U.S. dollar denominated balance sheet uh, would be very unpleasant. So I think that people who are concerned about those things need to own gold. And I think that, that message circulates well. And I think for better or worse, the gold price goes higher and perhaps much higher. Uh, moving on to gold's cousin, if you want to call it. Um, stepbrother, Silver, uh, I was curious to get your thoughts on why you've changed your forecast and feelings on Silver. I don't know that I have. What I told people about Silver was that traditionally Silver followed gold, that gold need to move, that the, the narrative needed to be established by gold and then Silver would follow through. What I tried to say in the interviews that I think you're referring to were that the silver stocks were truly a coiled spring. Mm. Uh, there was so much hate around the silver stocks, uh, probably as a consequence of their fail during the 2020 and 2021 silver squeeze. Uh, I, I like to say there's no hate more sincere than the hate of a jilted lover. Uh, and silver and the silver stocks certainly built up a lot of jilted lovers, uh, young jilted lovers. Uh, particularly passionate ones in 2020 and 2021. The consequence of that is that the silver stocks got way, way oversold. Uh, in my career, uh, that's happened three times before, uh, and I would adore to see it happen again. Uh, I own gold or physical bullion, I guess, as insurance. I own the silver stocks as a speculator, and, and describing them as coiled springs, uh, I think is really accurate. There is not enough market cap uh, in the legitimate silver stock space to handle the capital that will come into the space if the generalist investor buys into that narrative. I I've seen that happen before. Uh, I remember the early part of the decade of the 90s, that move in silver, when things like Pan American silver went from 50 cents to $45. Silver standard from 72 cents to $45. I'm not saying it's going to happen again. But I'd sure like to be part of it if it does. <laughs> Why don't we all? Um, Rick, you, you brought up the point that, you know, the reasons, I know there's many as to why you own gold. One of them is the 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 debt, which absolutely makes no sense. And, and I know, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but you don't see how we could possibly get out of it. Um, with the upcoming election, just curious to get your thoughts on what you think will be the top of mind uh, issues that will uh, sway and influence voters. I mean, I, I would think debt is on the top, but if we look at the landscape as the country as a whole, with everything happening, I mean, the uprisings we're seeing at, in universities, you know, folks upset about, you know, money that's being spent to Ukraine, should it be spent at home? Obviously the migrant issue, I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, for you, what besides the debt is the top concern? I think sadly, neither party cares much about the economy. Uh, mm. I haven't seen any evidence uh, going all the way back to the so-called Reagan revolution uh, that the Republicans are much better stewards of the nation's balance sheet than the Democrats. I, I think we're in the throes of culture wars. Uh, I think you, on one side, have a progressive, others would say woke ideology. Uh, and on the other side, you have a reactionary ideology. I'm not particularly drawn to either of them, frankly. Uh, I'm much more concerned about uh, 
the value proposition that if you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. But that doesn't seem to be on offer. Uh, I, Trump, as an example, is on record saying that, as an example, Social Security payments are too low. Social Security is unsustainable. <laughs> Medicare and Medicaid are unsustainable. Those are bad words, but they have a certain meaning in English around arithmetic, and they're true. Uh, I don't see the Democrats uh, having any interest in reducing current spending, and I don't see the Republicans having any interest in reducing current spending. The Republicans might be in favor of a tax cut, but a tax cut without a spending cut is only a tax deferral. <laughs> You have to borrow it or you have to print. I think it's absolutely inescapable that to the extent that we build up more U.S. dollar obligations, the only way we finance our way out of it is to devalue the U.S. dollar. And we're, we're not devaluing the U.S. dollar against other currencies because they're doing the same thing. I don't know the quantum, but I do remember in the decade of the 80, the decade of the 70s, pardon me, that uh, if you go from 1970 to 1980, the constant purchasing power of the U.S. dollar declined by 80 percent. And I suspect that that's what's going to happen to the holders of U.S. dollar denominated savings products in the next 10 or 15 years. I'm curious to get your insights on Canada, Rick, because I know you're speaking to me from Vancouver, uh, but I know you spent uh, quite ample time in Canada and are quite critical of many things happening uh, in Canadian politics right now. You're quite vocal about it on social media. Um, you know, Justin Trudeau is criticized for getting attention uh, for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and I've had guests like Kevin O'Leary on come on my show saying he's the worst prime minister and manager Canada has ever seen. Uh, we have a lot of folks in Canada who watch this show. So curious to get your take on, is Canada any better off than the U.S. right now? Uh, I heard on CBC the other night, yes, I occasionally watch it, uh, that he was elected because he was cute. Uh, I'm in, oh, no, gosh. I'm yeah. in no particular position to confirm or deny that, but I think it's an odd way to choose a prime minister. Um, I will say- And the selfies, it, all it, the it, selfies. <laughs> I will say that in one circumstance, uh, just one, Canada's better off than the United States. Canada's not trying to impose its will on 150 countries worldwide, uh, and it doesn't maintain troops in 100 of them. So in that sense, Canada's better off. Unfortunately, uh, in terms of debt per capita, including uh, federal and provincial debt, uh, and in terms of uh, government debt and government expenditure as a percentage of the GDP, Canada's in worse condition. Uh, and in Canadian parlance, a substantial part of that is what Canadians would call an own goal, uh, which is to say that the government, particularly the government's um, deliberate checking out of the oil and gas industry, uh, the, Canada, the, the industry that is Canada's most competitive industry, uh, is an absurdity. Uh, the prime minister has stated that there's no business case for Canadian natural gas backing out coal in world markets. All of Canada's major trading partners, the Chinese, the Germans, the Americans, have all said that they would love to increase the utilization of Canadian natural gas. I guess the reason that the prime minister suggests that there's no business case is that there can't be a business case if he won't allow it. But the idea that you maintain the level of social expenditure in Canada uh, with debt, with interest levels that are consistently higher than the United States uh, in the absence of any economic growth is a real challenge. Yeah. I'm yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, and I mean, obviously, as a Canadian, I spend a lot of time back home and I've been seeing all this social media buzz about like cost of living in Canada, you know, going to Costco and paying exaggerated prices. And when I was just there last week, I, I, I said I, I was floored by how expensive things have become in Canada. I mean, we talk inflation in the U.S., but I think it's it's definitely felt more in Canada 
uh, because the salaries aren't there. They're not equal to U.S. Right. salaries. And yet the cost of living um, has just, you know, quadrupled. You know, Americans are in no position to lecture other people uh, about government profligacy. But I need to say I've read now probably 100 pages of the 420 page budget uh, that the liberal government submitted uh, for consideration in Canada last week. Uh, and it, it is really, truly problematic. Part of it's political, of course, the politics of envy. Uh, the What I call the consolidated left, which is to say the liberals, the NDP, the Greens, mm -hmm. and the, Bloc, the Bloc Québécois, uh, command about 60% of the popular vote in Canada if you take them together. And the politics yeah. of envy play well with the consolidated left. So the idea that you raise capital gains taxes, as an example, uh, penalizing the relative few uh, and not the many, plays well in Canada. The problem with it is it doesn't work. Uh, when you follow this eat the rich strategy, you need to prepare to starve <laughs> because the rich are the seed corn uh, for the Canadian economy. Uh, when you de-emphasize uh, the one industry where you're actually, in terms of technology and everything else, a world leader, which is to say oil and gas, <laughs> you have a, a, a difficult time with your expenditures. Uh, there is everything wrong with that budget. Remembering, of course, the prime minister's promise eight years ago that the budget would balance itself. Uh, he is either unwitting or he is unscrupulous. Uh, one or the other, there's no middle ground. What he is for sure is enumerate. Uh, he can't add and he can't subtract, nor <laughs> his finance minister. Well, well let's, not, let's not even get started there. But And I, and I don't mean to go on a tangent, but I, I really like having conversations with with people who spend time in both Canada and the US and, and you know, looking at comparisons and where we can do better or, or learn from each. Uh, just curious on this, uh, in terms of healthcare, right, Rick? Yep. And like I said, not to go on a crazy tangent, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts. Should, if, if, if God forbid someone were to get a critical illness, do you think you're better off living in Canada where it's free or in the United States? If you live in Canada, and you have the means to get yourself treated in the United States, uh, if you get critically ill, that's probably the best of all worlds. Uh, Canada is a wonderful place to have a baby. Uh, it's an okay place to have measles. But Canada is not a good place to get cancer uh, because the waiting lines for treatment are truly insane. Uh, all of the Canadians I know of means who have gotten a serious illness, I mean every single one of them who survived, has left Canada to be treated and then come back to Canada for maintenance after they've been treated uh, in the United States. O oddly, uh, the biggest beneficiaries that I know of, of the Canadian medical system are Americans. Very high quality Canadian doctors <laughs> go to the United States to practice where they can make twice as much money uh, and spend less. And the patients who can afford treatment go to the United States to be treated too by these high quality Canadian doctors. <laughs> there's a there's a hospital in Palm Springs, California, which is, as you probably know, the farthest south city in Canada, actually. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a doc, there's a hospital called Eisenhower that is populated as to sort of 30% by Canadian patients and as to sort of 40% by Canadian doctors. <laughs> they actually had, ought to have a Canadian flag on Eisenhower. And I think that's sort of indicative of the bad parts of the Canadian healthcare system. There's lots of right. bad parts of the American healthcare system too. It's been captured uh, by the medical establishment and by the drug establishment. And U.S. expenditures on healthcare per capita are unreasonably high. Uh, so I'm not trying to say that the U.S. has a panacea in terms of healthcare policy. I'm only trying to say that the Canadian policy uh, works really well until you have a really bad problem. Uh, and then, because in Canada they ration by availability as opposed to price, uh, what you have to do is go to Great Britain to be treated, uh, or go to Hong Kong to be treated, or go to the United States to be treated. It works, works relatively well for the rich. 
Yeah. All right. Well, moving on. <laughs> Thank you for entertaining me with that and educating me with your thoughts. Um, I thought of you when I was listening um, to a, uh, a podcast uh, where financial guru expert David Ramsey was speaking. And I, you know, most of the time when Rick and I are in the same room, we actually don't talk gold, we actually talk life. And David Ramsey was saying it's emotionally difficult right now. He was referring to folks who want to start small business, which, as we know, is really the backbone of America. But he says this, and this is the part that made me think of you, Rick. He says, and guess what? It's always been difficult. If you were in the 70s, you had the Vietnam War. If you were in the 80s, you had inflation. You just name it. There's always something telling you not to do it. Yep. Um, they were speaking because data from Forrester showed a surge of younger generations scooping up existing small businesses with 64% of all buyers being born after 19, 1980 as of February 2023. So we see uh, uh, you know, the younger generation uh, wanting to build their own business. Uh, but you know, look at the landscape we're living in. I mean, do you agree with Ramsey that it's just always been tough? I absolutely positive, positively do. Uh, I, I think it's always been tough. I think if you have the guts to smart, start a small business, the right time to do it is as soon as you possibly can. If you can see a need out there that needs to be met and you can figure out how to do it, uh, and you have the determination to do it. If you have the determination to outwork competitors to serve a need, the right time to do it is always now. This is probably an especially good time to grow a small business because so many private businesses are uh, owned and controlled by baby boomers who are retiring. There are gonna be literally millions of businesses that come for sale. Uh, by people who are too old or too rich or both to care on an ongoing concern. And the opportunity for young people uh, to step into this incredible wave of the disposition of private businesses that have been built up by baby boomers over 40 or 50 years uh, and are now going to be for sale or either abandoned is a spectacular spectacular opportunity. It's important uh, if you're going to be an entrepreneur that you don't get in your own way. You're going to have enough things in front of you that are a challenge. Uh, you don't need to and you should not worry about Biden or Trudeau or Trump. The really good news is as a small business person, male or female, they don't know that you exist. <laughs> They aren't your biggest risk. Your biggest risk is to the left of your right ear and to the right of your left ear. It's all you. And if you want to start a, business, a small business, uh, the right time to do it is always as soon as you possibly can. No matter what you do, the first two or three years are going to be hard. So for God's sake, get them over with. Do it. <laughs> Just yes. do it. Just do it. Um, and on that note, because I love life insights and advice from Rick Rule. If you want to hear more from Rick, you can join me in Boca Raton, July 7th to the 11th for the Rule Symposium. How's that for a segue to talk your incredible conference? Danielle DiMartino Booth, Nomi Prince, Jim Rickards, Grant Williams. I mean, the list goes on and on. I can't wait for if it, you Rick. Care about if you care about gold, we're sponsored by the World Gold Council. If you care about silver, we're sponsored by the Silver Institute. Uh, we have really, yeah. truly everything going for us in the circumstance. I think it's important to note, too, Daniela, two things. Uh, at my conference, unlike any other conference I know of, every single exhibitor there is content, not just an advertiser. We vet every single one. Public company exhibitors that aren't owned in my accounts aren't permitted to exhibit. Doesn't mean every stock I buy goes up, but it does mean that they're vetted. The second thing, and this is important, is I think that we're the only investment conference in the world that if you pay the tuition fee, whether you show up in person, which is what I would prefer, or if you join live stream like 1,300 other people last year, if you don't think that we have delivered good value to you, 
gold-plated money-back guarantee. The financial risk is all mine. No other financial conference in the world that I know of has an absolute gold-plated money-back guarantee. If you don't think you got your money's worth, I'll give you your money back. I'd prefer nice. that you told me how I could serve you better, but that's not a requirement. Absolute yep. money-back guarantee. I have no doubt it's going to be phenomenal. I personally can't wait. So if you want to join me and go on a boat, right? <laughs> Isn't there a dinner cruise or you know, we've, part of it, we, Rick? We've been doing that since we held the conference in Vancouver. Uh, we found we had these optional uh, boat cruises where people could get to know each other socially, where people could, uh, you know, uh, buy a drink on me for Daniela or Jim Rickards or Nomi Prince. Uh, it, it turns out that those mixers, those sort of four hour boat cruises, uh, first of all, they're enormously amusing and Florida will be doing the intercoastal canal instead of, you know, Vancouver Harbor, but it's a wonderful place to get to know other attendees. It's a wonderful place just to have a good time. It, it's odd that one of the most popular features of my conference is something I have almost nothing to do with, which is to say the boat cruise, <laughs> but it's very worthwhile doing. Well, we, like I said, I can't wait to be there. Uh, we'll have the description um, in the link below uh, for folks who want to sign up uh, to come on down to Boca Raton. And uh, lastly, I must ask, uh, how is Battle Bank going? You're wear I see you're wearing the T-shirt. I mean, I ask this because uh, Battle Bank is such a different type of bank. I mean, we talk about banks all the time on the show uh, of banks basically failing, but yours is a completely different, uh, completely different than traditional banks. Yeah, Danielle, I, I I mean, the disclaimer is I'm a 71 year old, you know, I've seen a lot of things before. And, and I've been, I've been disappointed by a lot of banks. I've been an investor in banks, because I'm an entrepreneur, and I see a market need that needs to be filled. Right? You'll recall our last bank ever bank, uh, which we grew from a standing start to a $28 billion bank before it was sold. Uh, but a lot of the a lot of the problems that we addressed with Everbank uh, are, are no longer being addressed by them. So we're doing it again. First of all, we're branchless. Uh, branches, to me, don't serve very many purposes. Uh, a phone or a computer turns out to be a perfectly adequate branch. Uh, we don't like the idea that our depositors shouldn't be paid interest on their checking accounts. <laughs> Money is money. Uh, we don't believe that people should be constrained as to what currency they deposit their money in. So we'll offer insured deposits in 20 currencies. We believe your IRA is your IRA, uh, IRA not a repository for some other financial institutions products. You can own a duplex in your IRA with us. You can buy a franchise in your IRA. And finally, uh, Daniela, this will be of interest to you all. No other bank in the country will make secured loans against physical holdings of gold and silver in segregated accounts. The idea that these other banks don't think that gold is good security is absolutely mind numbing to me, but I'm delighted that that's the way they see the world. <laughs> so yeah, if you are disappointed with your current bank, come check out Battle Bank. If you're an accredited investor uh, or a qualified client and you'd like to be an owner of Battle Bank, uh, that offering is only made by offering memorandum, go to battlebank.com uh, and download the offering memorandum. Uh, in addition to being a depositor and a borrower, we'd love it uh, if you were accredited, if you wanted to be an owner. We want to be owned by our customers. Cool. Thank you. Always Rick? a pleasure, Matt. <laughs> I look forward more than I can tell you uh, to seeing uh, you in Boca Raton. I also would like to say any of your listeners who liked what I've had to say about gold and resources should go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource stocks, and I will personally rank them. No obligation. He does. No charge. He does. He answers every single one. And that's why we love you, Rick. And uh, we'll see you very soon. Well, I'll see you in July. And if I may just add, uh, we obviously speak a lot about gold and silver investing here. If you have any questions uh, surrounding 
old silver strategies. I encourage everyone to reach out to one of my incredible colleagues over at ITM Trading. You can find that Calendly calendar link where you can book a free session. It's a lot of fun, super informative. You'll learn something. And like I said, it's free. Just give it a try. You could do so in the description uh, below the video. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way as always. Don't forget to sign up at daniellacomboni.com so you can stay on top of it all. So much information for you folks. We'll see you soon.